Great to be at ApacheCon today. So uh, let's get started with this topic. I will today talk about Apache Kafka and tier storage to, to use together with machine learning frameworks like TensorFlow for streaming machine learning. So this is really some kind of new architecture which many people have not seen yet or used yet. Um, but this is really an idea to show you how you can leverage machine learning with Kafka without using a data lake like HDFS or something like that. My name is Kai, I'm working for Confluent. and I'm doing use cases around Kafka for four years. So I've seen plenty of different projects and architectures and uh, machine learning is one of the hot topics I think and therefore I think this is a, a great discussion today. First of all, really the primer. Um, what's very important because I talk about tiered storage today. So first of all, what I will show you today um, is a tiered storage implementation from Confluent, which is already GA and you can use that in production. But it, this is a commercial tool and having said that, um, Confluent is also working together with um, the open source community around Kafka to provide tiered storage as part of the Apache Kafka open source project. So the current status in September 2020 is that um, Uber has the lead on the open source tiered storage implementation um, and is working together with Confluent and others. And it's expected that um, tiered storage will come into Kafka's 3.0, um, which will release early 2021. So um, then there will be different storage options under the hood, like what I will show you today is implemented, for example, for S3 and Google Cloud Storage. And we also certified, for example, pure storage for on-premise already and others coming. And the open source will be more like an interface so that different storages can also be adopted. And Uber, as far as I know, is working, for example, on an HDFS option for tiered storage. So this is really the background um, for you to understand this about tiered storage, what's available and what's coming. But this is definitely a, a real game changer for how you can use Kafka. And so um, just as an introduction, I will not do a deep dive into Kafka. I hope you know that already. My main point here is really that you understand that when I mean event streaming, I really talk about continuously processing data. That's where we see most of the use cases where the real added value comes from. So of course you can use Kafka just as ingestion layer into a data lake like Hadoop and do a lot of MapReduce and Spark there. Um, but the really added value for innovative use cases is to correlate the data in real time with stream processing, with streaming analytics. This can be something like Kafka streams or KSQL in a Kafka native way, or of course also something like Flink, for example. And today I don't want to talk just about um, uh, Kafka uh, for event streaming, but really how to use it together with machine learning. And in the real world, we see a lot of different use cases here where this makes sense together. And this is, of course, some really cutting edge use cases, like if you do something like speech translation for building chatbots or a customer service, this is where uh, neural networks are used for deep learning and so on. This is, of course, what you can do and it works well. But on the other side, uh, in, in the real world today, I would say that still 80% of the machine learning use cases are more about um, solving existing problems or improving them, like cross-selling or customer churn or fraud detection. That's use cases which exist for many years already, and there are already business rules implemented. But, uh, but adding machine learning here can simply make the, the um, behavior better, like uh, selling more or reducing the risk and these kind of things. So whatever your use case is, Kafka and machine learning are really very complementary to each other for many different use cases. In this talk today, um, I will use the example of a connected car infrastructure. Um, the reason is that um, this is really a use case which is interesting because this is needs to be highly available, highly scalable and real time for high volume of throughput. So we have customers in the uh, automotive industry which really build connected car infrastructures across the globe. And this really means uh, millions of cars which stream data in real time and need to be connected so that you can correlate the data. And therefore, um, at, at many companies, this is already the reality, like um, one of our public references, references for this is Audi, which has started building this together with us um, five years ago, which is already in production for some years now. And, and the status quo for this talk here is that we expect, we as an automotive company already have the connected car infrastructure in place. Um, this is important because we now want to improve this with machine learning to make our use cases even better. 
So that's the main idea. And so what I will show you today is if you have a Kafka streaming platform, how can you use machine learning on top of that? In our case, we use um, it for detecting anomalies for predictive maintenance, but this really doesn't matter much, right? For any kind of industry, um, the, the architecture looks very similar. And therefore, um, this is, as I said, um, the, the foundation. So let's assume we already have a streaming platform in place with Kafka. We integrate to some edge devices, like in this case, it's cars, or in other cases, it might be mobile apps or machines or PLCs. Um, and then on the other side, we also integrate with real-time systems. I mean, that's what many people use Kafka for, um, like a real-time monitoring system that consumes the data with very low latency. But in parallel to that, and that's one of the key strengths of Kafka, um, you can also consume it, for example, from a batch platform in parallel. The great thing about Kafka is because it's not just a messaging system like RabbitMQ, but also a storage system. So you really decouple the different producers and consumers from each other. And that's important because the car sensors, they produce data continuously and they don't care if all consumers can consume the data in real time. Maybe one other system is down, or maybe a batch system only processes overnight. So this is where Kafka is really great in the middle. And now we want to add machine learning to that. So my definition of machine learning is that um, it's algorithms which allow computers to find hidden insights without being explicitly programmed where to look. And machine learning is also nothing new. So many of these algorithms exist for, for tens of years, right? And of course, now we also have these neural networks, which are now we have the compute power for doing something like a convolutional neural network for image recognition. Or in our case, um, I will talk about an autoencoder to do anomaly, um, anomaly detection. This is an unsupervised deep learning model. But it really doesn't matter. Depending on the use case, choose the right algorithms and embed them into your infrastructure. There is no single algorithm which solves every problem. So back to our architecture. We simply use the streaming architecture we already have in place often, like in our case, a connected kind infrastructure. And we add additional infrastructure and use cases. So in this case, you see two green boxes. This is the ML, which we add. In the middle, we see the model training. So this model training consumes data from the streaming platform and then trains a model. Most of the model training is typically done in batch. There is a few online model models available, like if you do online clustering, but almost all of them in reality are batch training. But still, you consume the data from this pipeline, and then you take maybe the last 10 minutes, maybe the last hour or the last day, and then you train your model. And when the model is trained after 10 minutes or an hour or a day, you have a binary which you can deploy somewhere to use it. And in this case, on the right side, it's a, another streaming real-time application where we embed our analytic model into that for example, to do predictive maintenance. And in addition to that, we still have this other batch platform, which does some other stuff like creating reports for a dashboard. And really in reality, this is much harder than many people think because there is a huge impedance mismatch between the data science team, which typically uses Python and things like Jupyter notebooks to do rapid prototyping on historical data and then building a model. And that's what data scientists are great in. But I've seen so many customers across the globe where they had the problem that they were not able to deploy their great and accurate models to production. So in production, this typically means um, in real time and at scale, and most often with a 24 seven uptime requirement. And this is not what you do with Python and Jupyter typically. And so there is this huge impedance mismatch between data science and production deployments. And that's what many people now use Kafka for to solve this mismatch. And a key here really to understand is that there are, is this hidden technical depth in machine learning systems. This is a great paper by Google, um, already a few years old, where you see that um, the ML code, the small box in the middle, this is the thing where you write the Python code um, for training a model. So this is great. And in every tutorial you use today for TensorFlow or others, you write 20 lines of Python code, and then you have a great model which can do amazing things like image recognition or uh, translation or anything else. But um, this is just a small part of the problem. And even the data scientist typically spends most of the time on other tasks. And as you can see here, something like data collection is really much harder than you think. Um, so 
Um, the data scientist, of course, he can take the historical data from the connected car infrastructure if it's already stored somewhere in a data lake. But collecting the data from a million cars, um, that's a little bit a harder thing to do. And that's why this box is bigger than the ML code box. And also for serving the models and for doing monitoring and for having a process around that. Um, that's so many things which you have to solve around just writing the model code. That's what many people are not aware of in the beginning. So let's take a few examples where we already have um, a scalable and technology agnostic machine learning infrastructure. Netflix, for example, has built a very powerful recommendation engine so that every user sees context specific recommendations depending on the device he uses, the behavior and history of, of what he watches, the ratings he does, um, the time of the day, the location and all these kind of things so that you get context specific recommendations. Uber and also other ride-sharing applications like Lyft and all the same in Asia and in Europe, they all use machine learning a lot to do things like calculating the estimated time of arrival, calculating the estimated cost, calculating the right routing. And all of this has to happen in real time because otherwise um, you will move from the Uber app to the Lyft app, for example. And this has to run 24 seven because if your Uber app is down for an hour, you don't just lose revenue, but people will go to the competition. And in addition to that, they will also complain on Twitter and Facebook about that. And the last example is PayPal. So this is really critical business transactions. Every payment is important. And so the fraud detection infrastructure from, from PayPal is not just about one model, but this is many different models to detect fraud. And this is really a huge architecture. And uh, what these three examples have in common is that, again, though all of them need to act in real time, at scale for millions of events, and with zero downtime. And so this is a critical infrastructure, and that's not what you do with Python and Jupyter Notebooks, right? And uh, no surprise here, right? So all three of them therefore use Kafka under the hood as a central system for this infrastructure and combine Kafka with machine learning to build such a reliable and scalable infrastructure. And um, now let's think about how we can do this in other projects. So this is where Kafka comes into play in general. So um, on a high level, it's really important to understand that Kafka is not just a messaging layer, but it's really also a storage layer to decouple the different systems. Some can consume the data in real time, some others in batch, and some others with request response via REST API from the mobile app. That's totally fine. And therefore, Kafka is really um, a streaming platform, messaging and storage, but also it provides data integration capabilities with Kafka Connect, both to legacy systems like a mainframe and to an IBM MQ system, and also to modern systems like MQTT or to machine learning frameworks and, and any other application. And also it provides um, processing capabilities with Kafka Streams. Um, so this means that you can have a whole platform to do all this data correlation and integration in real time at scale, highly available. That's why so many people use the Kafka ecosystem more and more. And now if you think about machine learning, um, this really complements this, right? So machine learning in the end is always two things on a high level. On the one side, you need to do model training, which you see here on the bottom right. Model training means that you take historical data coming from all these data sources where you collect it from. And then you take this data and put your algorithm on top of that. And then you do some computation and then you get a model out of that, which is a binary. And this is the model. So this is good, but this is only half the part because then you need to deploy this model into production, which you can see here on the bottom left, where you do these predictions. And often this has to be done in real time, reliably at scale with low latency. So very often model training and model deployment are completely separated from each other. And this is okay, right? You can do model training in a data lake and deploy your models to a smaller lightweight application. And so Kafka used, um, of course, as the ingestion layer into a data lake. That's one of the first use cases in analytics. But you can do so much more with Kafka. Like, as I said, um, for example, there's Kafka Connect to integrate to all of these data sources and things. You don't want to integrate this integration by yourself. And you can even produce from other systems, like from a Python consumer or from a Go consumer or producer. And so as you see here on the bottom right, um, the data science team probably prefers the Python client to use and connect to the data um, from the Jupyter Notebook instead of using Java or something like this. But on the bottom left, often you use another technology like Kafka Streams or KSQL DB, um, which is more uh, 
well, it, it's based on Java and it simply has different kind of, of um, latency and, and, and um, performance SLAs than, than Python has. But, but the choice is up to you. That's the great thing. So let's think about this a little bit um, more from a step-by-step -step approach um, about what do you do to, to build this now for our connected car infrastructure. So first of all, we need to do the data collection. So we ingest the IoT data somehow into the Kafka cluster. And um, in our case, we can use Kafka Connect, for example, with an MQTT connector to do that. And then from there, we ingest it into the analytics uh, pipeline, right? However, having said that, um, a very common approach we see, and this is true in automotive, but also in many other industries, that actually we even here see a separation of concerns. So we see a mission critical Kafka cluster where you do your um, business transactions and workloads, which have to run 24 seven with zero data loss. And separated from that, we replicate the data into another Kafka cluster where we do the analytics. Uh, this is often for SLAs and uptime requirements and latency requirements, but also for other reasons that you simply want to separate the business transactions from the analytical workloads. Um, so um, we even have customers which use Confluent only for the mission critical workloads and then they replicate the data into a not so critical cluster which might run on Cloudera. That's totally fine, right? Um, so there's different options how you do that. But in the end, you need to get your data from the data sources into Kafka so that you can do the next steps on that. And the next step typically is processing the data. And if you think about that, it's the same impedance mismatch. Um, of course, a data scientist can use Python and the Jupyter Notebook for doing some, uh, some um, processing. However, if you want to connect, for example, to the connected car data, um, this is millions of events per second from, from thousands or hundreds of thousands of cars. So you don't want to do that in your Jupyter Notebook. So um, ideally, you do this with scalable streaming technologies. And um, here you now have to ask yourself the question, well, um, of course, you could also just ingest everything into a Spark and use Spark streaming with that, or you can use Flink as an external cluster. Or like in this example, you use Kafka native technologies like Kafka Streams or KSQL DB. This has the huge advantage that you have just one single infrastructure, not just for data ingestion, but also for data processing, because these tools use Kafka under the hood. Just one single infrastructure to run and operate 24-7 instead of a separate Flink or Spark cluster. But whatever is your choice, you do the pre-processing with these tools. And then as a next step, you need to ingest it somewhere. Before that, here is one example of such a KSQL query. And um, with this KSQL query, we do some streaming ETL. In this case, it's more or less like Hello World, right? Um, we filter out of the car data only the data for one specific model type, a very simple um, filtering approach. But of course, you can do man many more powerful steps here. And the great thing about this query here is that um, this is pretty straightforward and everybody can do that. But you can use this on the one side for rapid prototyping. Like you see here, you can even embed this easily in a Jupyter notebook to combine this with your Python code. So you can consume the data from a Kafka cluster with KSQL like here, or you could also use the Confluent Python client if you want to do more Python code instead of um, SQL. And then you um, use your other favorite Python tools like NumPy or Scikit-Learn and then your TensorFlow API. So this can all be combined in a Jupyter notebook to be very agile and, and rapid. But then this also solves this impedance mismatch because you can deploy this query into a production cluster to process millions of events per second. Because even this simple query is just Kafka under the hood, which you don't see when you do this, right? But in this way, you can do the data science team do their work. But then when it's done with the prototyping, you can deploy the same process into a production cluster without any code changes or any wrapper code or something like that. So this is why I think this is a great example. And then um, when you have done your processing with something like KSQL or maybe with Flink or Spark streaming, then you need to ingest it into your data store where you do model training. In our case, we are on Google Cloud, so we ingest everything into Google Blob Storage, Google Cloud Storage, so that we can run our model training on top of that. So um, in addition to that, also we have other consumers, right? So that's the beauty about Kafka. Some are real time, some are batch. And in this case, we do ingestion into the cloud store for a model training. And then we train our model finally after all these steps. And this is where the cloud is great. And um, here you can uh, do extreme scale and scale up and then scale down after the model training. 
And, and this is not related to Kafka at all. So here also to be clear, so Kafka is not machine learning. Kafka is complementary to machine learning, right? And here in this case, we use TensorFlow to train a model. As I said, in our case, we use an autoencoder. This is um, an unsupervised concept for um, detecting anomaly. But whatever you use, this is just one example of, of having a model. The big point here now is that we have a model and this is a binary which we can deploy anywhere else. And now I want to talk a little bit more about this architecture um, because as I mentioned before, um, you don't necessarily need another data lake to do model training. So you can directly consume the data from Kafka into your ML framework. Like here we use TensorFlow and it's IO Kafka plugin to directly consume from TensorFlow and, and get it from Kafka log to train a model with that. So it's pretty straightforward and completely simplifies your architecture because you don't need an additional S3 or HDFS interface for that. So this is really huge and it's great. And then later you can also replay the data. So many people use Kafka for that because in Kafka the events are appended in an event-based way with timestamps and with guaranteed ordering. And so you can replay the data later again. Maybe use another Kafka, con another TensorFlow configuration with other hyperparameters, or maybe a month later you want to try out a completely different ML framework like Data Robot for AutoML and compare it to your customized TensorFlow model. And this is then typically also where tiered storage comes into play. Because, um, of course, um, you can store data in Kafka forever with retention time minus one. So that's not the problem from a technical perspective. But the big problem is with Kafka only, um, this can get pretty expensive. And also the scalability is harder when you have terabytes of data in your Kafka cluster. And um, still, um, we want to simplify this. And that's why um, tiered storage makes so much sense. With tiered storage, you can avoid having another data lake in addition to Kafka to pay and operate and integrate. And with this, you can reduce the cost, but still have this long-term storage. And you still have this performance isolation. So this means you can still have your real-time consumers, which continuously process the data. But your data science team can spin up a Jupyter notebook and consume historical data and train a model on top of that from the same Kafka cluster. And a huge advantage of tiered storage is now that you offload most of the data from the Kafka brokers into an object store. So as I said in the beginning of this talk, um, with Confluent tiered storage, which is GA already, you can use things like S3 or Google Cloud storage or even pure storage, for example, on-premise. And um, soon this will also get into the um, open source Kafka as part of the KIP 405, um, which Confluent is working on with the community. And with tiered storage, then you can save a lot of money, but still store data long-term in Kafka to reprocess historical data in an event-based manner. And that's really huge. And also scalability gets much better because if you think about a disk crash, for example, if you need to synchronize terabytes of data in a Kafka cluster, this can take hours. But with tiered storage, it doesn't because only 1% or so of your data is actually in the brokers which you need to synchronize. Everything else is offloaded to the tiered storage. And the big advantage, however, is that tiered storage does not change your client applications. So the client API is exactly the same. So no code breaking changes here. And that's really huge. So as a client, you don't even know if you're using tiered storage under the hood. And also because this question comes up all the time, you don't have to be worried about the throughput. So um, if you consume historical data, um, there, the, the, the difference between consuming from the disks on the broker and consuming from the object store. So from the tests we did, um, there, this is really neglect, neglectable. So if you consume it from S3 or from the EBS volumes, um, this doesn't make much change um, if you consume historical data. And there are so many use cases why you want to reprocess data. In this talk, I focus much on machine learning, so you can take a look at old data and consume it to train new models on that. Um, this might be for, um, you found out that a fraud happened a year ago, and so the data scientists have to take a look at the old data and train models also on the old data. Um, but there is many other use cases, like for compliance and regular reprocessing, you also need to consume old data. And there is really many uh, use cases why you want to keep data in an event-based manner for long term to reprocess it again and again later. And this is where tiered storage is really helpful because you can even store bigger data in a cost-efficient way. So now, after I talked about the model training a lot, um, of course, we also want to deploy our model, right? No matter if we deployed it in the cloud in a data lake with Spark or something else, then the model deployment often happens somewhere completely different, like in a factory or in a car or on the mobile app. 
And this is no problem because Kafka is just a binary, uh, the model is just a binary, right? And there is two options for model deployment and I cannot go into detail today. I have another Kafka Summit talk, which you might look up, where I talk 60 minutes just about model deployment with Kafka because there's a lot of trade-offs you need to understand better. But on a high level, there's two options. Um, that's the data science version here. So um, you use a model server, right? Um, every machine learning framework or product has one. So you deploy your model there. And then from your Kafka application, you do an RPC call to that uh, model server. The big problem here from a Kafka perspective is that while you have a streaming application, you always have to do an RPC call to do the model prediction. And this is not a good architecture. It still works for some use cases, right? It's still good enough. But for example, like for connected car infrastructure, where you have millions of events per second, and you need to, to, to do model predictions in real time in a robust way with low latency. And the much better architecture is to directly embed your model into the Kafka application. And this is also pretty straightforward to do. Many people are surprised how easy that is, but a model is just a binary. And you can easily load that into your Kafka application so that you don't have this RPC call to another server. Because you have to think about the trade-offs of using a model server, like what do you do if the RPC is not possible or if the latency is not good? How do you do error handling? What do you do if you use exactly one semantics in Kafka and you have a failure with the model server? There, there's many trade-offs you have to compare here. Um, so um, know the, the, the pros and cons of both and, and make the right call depending on your SLAs and requirements. Here is one example again with KSQL. So this is so powerful. Here is a very simple query. We create an anomaly detection where we consume the sensor ID from the cars and we use a user-defined function, which I implemented, detect anomaly, which uses the sensor values. And under the hood, we embedded this anomaly detection with the TensorFlow model, which we trained before in the cloud. And with this, we can do model predictions in real time at scale for millions of events. And, and this is really huge because this query can be deployed like this into KSQL servers without any additional wrapper code or configuration. And because this is just Kafka under the hood, using partitions and replication and Kafka topics and all these things, you don't have to worry at all about high availability or latency or scalability. This is just a Kafka application like anything else, but it's very simple to build this, right? And so now here we see again our architecture I talked before, now with technologies mapped. Uh, typically, when we talk about connected cars, um, the interface is MQTT because this works also in bad networks or if you're offline when you're driving through a tunnel. And from that, we integrate, for example, with Kafka Connect to get the data into the cluster. And then we use something like KSQL for pre-processing the data. And as I said before, um, in this case, we directly consume the data with TensorFlow from Kafka without any other data lag in the middle. And then we train our model and deploy this and the model scoring is also happening in another Kafka application. This can, for example, be a Kafka Streams Java application, completely separate from model training. And in addition to that, in this example, we have also built a digital twin with MongoDB, which is simply another use case, completely separated from the analytics use cases. In Kafka, typically, as soon as you have a pipeline built in your organization, many other business units come and, and want to use some of the data. because And, and that's what the strength of Kafka, because everything is decoupled. So um, with this architecture in mind, we have actually exactly built this. So you can check out the GitHub link. Um, we have built this demo. Um, in our case, we have built it on Kubernetes so that um, it's um, an example which you can build by yourself and also on premise or in any cloud. But of course, you could also do the same, for example, with fully managed Confluent Cloud. Um, the, the big point here is also that um, we even used Python for the production deployment of the model scoring. So you. You don't have to use Java for that, right? Um, even this application um, can be done with Python. So in our case, we built a, a Python container, which has just two libraries in there. It has the um, Kafka consumer to consume the streaming data. And we have the model from TensorFlow, which is embedded to do the predictions in real time. And while I said in the beginning that, of course, it doesn't perform as well as a Java application because it's not compiled bytecode under the hood, but still it performs very well for many use cases. So we have customers which just use the Python client and process over 100,000 messages per second. So for many use cases, this is still good enough. Having said this, in a use case like connected cars with millions of cars, um, maybe a Java app is better, but that's up to you and your architecture. Or maybe use Golang instead. That's all up to you. You're very flexible here.
And as I said, so I have this demo and I have also many other demos for um, Kafka together with machine learning. So I have built examples for deploying things like um, TensorFlow and H2O and Deep Learning for J within Kafka Streams and KSQL apps. So this is pretty straightforward if you're a developer and you can do this easily by yourself. And it really doesn't matter which machine learning framework to use. So to conclude the session, so in, in the end, really the huge advantage is that with Kafka, you can um, build one pipeline to rule them all. And that's, of course, intentionally a little bit provoking, right? Um, of course, you can still combine this with something like Spark or Fling or anything else. Um, I'm just saying you really should always evaluate um, to keep your architecture as simple as possible, because every additional cluster you add, this makes the complexity much harder. And especially for the more mission critical use cases with high SLAs and low latency requirements, um, the, the less infrastructure you use, the better it is for you um, regarding an, an operations perspective. And especially now where I introduced you to tiered storage today, it's pretty straightforward to also use Kafka, not just for real time applications, but also, for example, for using data science teams to consume old data from Kafka, historical data. and use your favorite machine learning infrastructure like Python and Jupyter together with something like NumPy and Scikit-Learn and the TensorFlow API to train models and then deploy them. So this is really the, the, the main lesson learned here from that. And with that, I'm at the end of my talk. I hope you liked it and got an overview about what you can do together with Kafka and machine learning. And um, also feel free to connect to me on LinkedIn and on Twitter to stay in touch about this. Um, I'm happy to also discuss with you and engage more. And therefore, I, I really hope you, you like this. And now, if you also have any questions, I'm, I'm monitoring the chat window. So um, feel free to also ask um, any questions now. So um, yeah, exactly. Here's the one question. Um, which scenario is better in terms of data analysis performance? So um, data to Kafka and then to TensorFlow or data to Kafka and then to Spark. And, and this really depends exactly on, on what you want to do. I mean, um, if, if you are thinking about um, you definitely want to use TensorFlow, then there is no need to ingest it into another data lake where you also can use Spark. So this is actually the question. It's not so much about performance, but about really what consumers you need. If you want to train models with TensorFlow, um, then there is no added value if another data lake with Spark. Having said this, um, Spark also does some things very well. For example, if you want to do more like a batch-based processing, um, so um, or if you want to do shuffling all of the data at once, this is where another data lake makes sense because that was they were built for and where they are better. So most of our customers actually um, do not have just one single um, solution for that. So they have this pipeline and then they build their own materialized views on top of that. Some use cases with Spark, some others with TensorFlow, and then and maybe in the future also with AutoML or with other use cases. So if you want to see a great example for that, um, you can Google for BMW Kafka Summit because BMW presented a framework where they build an NLP solution, so natural language processing, on top of Kafka. Because from the beginning, BMW knew that they don't have just one, one ML framework for that. They had different use cases, and for some, they used some Python frameworks. For some others, they used Java frameworks. And for some others, they used native cloud services. And so they built an orchestration pipeline around Kafka to um, be very flexible and technology agnostic here. So again, um, just Google for BMW and Kafka Summit. They talked about this, I think, one or two years ago. And this is a great talk with slides and video recording where they explain in detail why they combine Kafka together with the machine learning frameworks. So this is really um, important to understand. And the other question is, do you have any benchmark of running a heavy model inference on milliseconds? In that case, you recommend going away from dedicated services. I mean, um, this is really not much related to Kafka now. And actually, I talked to a customer about such a problem yesterday. So the first important thing is you need to really find out um, where the blocker is. Is the blocker the um, processing pipeline or is it the model itself? Because in many cases, it's actually the model inference which takes much more time. Um, the, 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 the model processing from Kafka perspective, this typically is really end-to-end -end in 10, 20, 30, 40 milliseconds. But then if your model takes much 
much longer, or even the, the model pipeline, including some other pre-processing, then that's typically where the bottleneck is. So really find out where your bottleneck is to fix that. And based on that, um, we definitely have seen this challenge a lot also for these low latency use cases. And here it's also important from the beginning to choose the right machine learning technology. So this is not really a Kafka question because Kafka end-to-end -end latency, it can be very low if your infrastructure is good enough. But for the machine learning frameworks, we have seen customers which have built great Python models, um, but they didn't perform and execute well. So here um, we have seen customers um, where they used frameworks like H2O, for example. This is one of my favorite open source frameworks for, for low latency requirements, because you can do the model training with Python APIs, but the generated code is Java code, so it's compiled bytecode. And then um, the, the model inference can really be in less than a millisecond. So this doesn't really have any latency. And this really simply depends on your use case. We have seen use cases, for example, in manufacturing, in the production lines, assembly lines, where people did things like image recognition or things like um, and quality assurance with deep learning. And there really it's about milliseconds. And there they used H2O because that can be deployed at the edge while you still can do the model training in the cloud or in a data center. And this is the great thing about the separation between model training and model scoring. Okay, um, with that, I think I covered the question. So thank you a lot for watching this. And again, feel free to connect to me on LinkedIn to stay in touch. Thanks for watching and have a great ApacheCon. Goodbye.